God, we come before you. I ask, Lord, that our hearts would be open, our spirits would be willing to hear, that you would speak to us, Lord, in a manner that is able to have a great impact upon us. And Father, help us to understand those things that we feel can be quite difficult for our minds to grasp, but with your help, all is possible. I pray, Lord, that you will enable me to speak these words of truth and convey a message that you want me to convey to us, your people. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Jesus. We ask this in and through your name. Amen. I think it's important to begin this story by reminding ourselves of the character Joseph. If we recall, in the early days, he was the one who was favoured by his, his father. His brothers were somewhat envious of him because he was able to have wisdom that they could not convey. And at times, I think the brothers obviously found him a little bit arrogant and were actually quite envious of him. And the end result is, is, as we know, he's thrown into the well and ultimately the brothers lead the father to believe that he is dead. I wonder what it must have been like for Joseph at that time when he'd been taken in captivity. He was in a strange land. I'm absolutely sure he would have thought, why is this happening to me? How can this be happening to me? When I think back to how my life was, it was so different. I was the apple of my father's eye. And now I'm here alone. And at the moment, things aren't very good for me because it's lonely where I am. So his life had changed a great deal. And he probably felt that life had been very unfair to him because if he thought things through, he would have no doubt concluded that he should have been somewhere in the hierarchy within his own clan, with his own family. But this had not happened. Something that had happened, or the thing that had happened, was that he was very much, you know, disassociated from his family. We then have this situation where Pharaoh, who is a great man, a very powerful man, I'm sure when he clicks his fingers, people listen or listened at that time. And he begins to have these dreams. So Pharaoh being Pharaoh, he simply summons the wisest of the wise and the magicians of the magicians. And yet the wisest of the wise and the magicians of the magicians cannot help him. Now the interesting thing here is, is that in the society where he, he would have lived, the rules no doubt would have governed that generally you keep things in house. And there's a word that is used, and it, the, the word that the, the butler uses is the Hebrew. So this young man, who is the Hebrew, is brought to Pharaoh. And he is asked to interpret the dreams. And I think this point can't be lost on us, in as much as Pharaoh, as mighty and as powerful as he is, still has to bring in an outsider in order to solve the problems for him. And I'm wondering as well whether at the time Pharaoh, when he's listening to what is being said to him, it's beginning, we don't know this, whether it's beginning to awaken something in Pharaoh. Because he actually mentions uh, the belief in God in the passage that, that we've just read. So Pharaoh brings in this God-fearing gentleman and he listens to what he has to say and he takes it on board and he does as he is told to do. Now, from the other perspective, we then have Joseph. It's a bit of a tough call, isn't it? Because if he gets it wrong, he's in a lot of trouble and it will, it will transpire in time whether or not he's got it right. Because what Pharaoh then does, he says, after the interpretation has been given, 
which the magicians and the wise men could not do, Pharaoh then um, takes favor on him, great favor upon him, and gives him a great deal of power within, within the palace and the household. And he's got 14 years for this to unfold. Now, if it doesn't come to fruition, you can be absolutely certain that Joseph is not going to be in a very good place at all. And it's going to be apparent for all to see. And he's going to lose favor with Pharaoh. I'm wondering if at the same time, Joseph thinks, I'm not sure I'm going to be able to get this right. I'm not sure whether God is actually saying this to me. If at some point, we don't know, it's speculation only, that Joseph is thinking, maybe I'm going to say to Pharaoh, I don't think I can adequately interpret your dreams. I'm sorry, but you've got the wrong person. Because he would have known, that's Joseph, that if I get this wrong, I'm in a lot of trouble and I will pay for it. And yet he doesn't. He doesn't get it wrong and he does give the interpretation. So how do we account for this? Quite simply, it's simple, simple to say, but profoundly difficult to do, I would argue, is that he relies on God. I wonder what's going through his mind. I wonder if he's thinking, this can't be right. I don't believe this myself, but God, you're telling me to say it. So we're going to have seven years of um, plentifulness, if that's right, or seven years of um, lots of food, no problems, and then seven years of famine. So he tells him exactly what God wants him to, God wants him to convey. So that's the story to put it into a context. And as we know, things begin to unfold in a more wonderful way, which we'll find out later on in the Bible. I'm wondering how this particular um, story from the Bible can be made applicable in our lives. Or whilst not, not likely, I wouldn't have thought, but certainly not totally impossible, uh, you know, whether any, of, any one of us will get a call from the royal household and have to go <laughs> before the queen or one of the sons or one of the other family members and, you know, be asked to give some sort of counsel because somebody else was unable to do it. I guess it's not beyond the realms of possibility, but I think it's very unrealistic that that will happen. So how, does it, how, how do we then learn from this passage? Because we either take the view that the passage which it is as a historical event in the Bible and leave it at that. Or we look at it from a point of view and ask ourselves, what, what is God trying to say to me in this? What does God want me to learn from this? What is God maybe preparing me for? Well, let's go back and have a think about it. It's somebody who in an unlikely situation is asked to carry out a particular task in which a great deal of responsibility is placed on that individual. Now, it might not mean that the task that we're asked to do is solve the problems in the Middle East or stop the Third World War from happening. It might be something of a, great, um, of a scale not as great as that. Speaking personally, um, usually I get a phone call in the morning and they tell me where to go in the nicest sorts of ways. So I'll say, do you want to go out to this school? And generally I say, well, I need a bit of money today, so I'll kind of go out there and do what needs to be done. And in a way, it's, it's kind of, again, stepping into the breach, what Joseph did, as Joseph had to do. And some days, it's quite a breeze, and some days, it's absolutely fine. And it's like, I'm glad I got that phone call today. And other days, you kind of wish that the phone had been off the hook because it's not very pleasant for that period of time. But looking at it from a different perspective is what is God asking me to do? How is God asking me to step into the breach or to fill that gap? And being in that position of being able to believe that there is a purpose for what I'm doing on this particular day within this particular task. Sometimes I find that very difficult to do. And sometimes it's not until I look back and, and see how the whole thing fits together. Because going back to this story, 
what we will see is how the jigsaw puzzle all begins to fit to God together and we can see that God is very much involved in it. So thinking about our lives, it's trying to listen to that voice that God has, that message that God has in our lives and us trying to or seeking always to fulfill the purpose that he has for us. And like I said at the beginning, it, it, it needn't be something that, you know, the task that we're asked to do needn't be something that is enormous. It can be something simple. And yet that belief that I need to be here and I need to do this because this is what God is asking me to do. I was trying to think of a, an adequate story uh, where somebody had stepped into the gap and made a huge difference. And I couldn't think of anything on this scale at all. But I do remember a story that uh, was once told, and it was a, a true story, and ha doesn't have, I don't think, the greatest of endings if we look at it in worldly terms. But there was somebody who had been asked to step into the gap, and you wouldn't expect this person really to have um, carried out the task. In New York, there's a gentleman who runs a service for children and every Sunday he collects literally thousands of children and he takes them to church and then he follows up and does some work with the parents. And the areas that he goes into are by no means the most salubrious areas. And one day, one of his helpers came to him and said um, that there was a woman who would like to go on the buses and work with the children burning desire but there was a bit of a problem because the woman couldn't speak any any English and not a lot of the kids on the buses spoke a lot of Spanish so there's kind of a mismatch there so he said well that's all right he says why don't we look at it like this why don't we get the woman to teach the kids a bit of Spanish and there'll be some there that understand it anyways and why don't we get the kids to teach her some English and you know we kind of balance it out like that and then he said I've got, a, I've got an even better idea. Why don't we get the, um, the woman to sit next to that lad who never ever says anything to anybody. He just sits there in a world of his own. So as the weeks and months went by, this boy who never ever used to say anything to anybody began to open up very, very slowly. This woman was talking to him the best that she could. One of the things that she used to always say to, the, to him was... I love you and God loves you. Bearing in mind that a lot of these kids who were being picked up didn't have that love in their life. And then one day when the bus came to his stop and he got up to, to go off, the, the boy actually said something quite profound for him. As he got off the bus and the woman said the usual thing, um, I love you and God loves you, the little boy turned around and said, thank you, I love you too, miss. And he got off the bus. Sadly, as the week transpired, and the next day when the boy didn't get onto the bus, um, it became known that the mother who was having terrible problems with drugs and other social events had had a very bad night that night to such an extent that the little lad had been literally beaten to death. And I often think about what that boy must have thought when he got off that bus that day. What was that boy thinking? What were some of the last kind words that somebody had said to that child before literally he'd been murdered? I love you, God loves you. Now, you might say, well, actually, this, this thing about Joseph, that's, that's bigger stuff, that's, you know, reread it, you know, you haven't quite caught the point because, you know, he's in front of a king there. We're talking about little boy, didn't have much... It's not really the point, is it? We're talking about how God uses people. Whether God is using us, that's you and I, with people of great stature, kings and queens, <coughs> or in my case, with just ordinary everyday people. And the profound effects that that has. The difference between saying, it's a brilliant answer, it's a really good book, that's a really good picture, brilliant, bit of better colouring. Or picking up the sheet, well, this is a load of rubbish and putting it in the bin. Because I'll tell you which would damage me more and which would motivate me more. 
I often think as well of somebody who was very moved. Um, and again, it, it, he believed that God, and to a certain extent, God had sent him. He'd gone into one of the developing countries in the developing world. No doubt he'd taken some food packages and other things there. And he wanted to see what it was like. You know, how, do the other, how does the other half live? Or how does the other half starve? And whilst he was there, he, he was in one of the shanty towns trying to find out what, it, what is it like, a daily life like this. It was horrendous, worse than he could have ever imagined. And he found that it was in a house where there was great faith. And one day the woman and her family said they wanted to pray for him. They thought, this, this is great, what are, what are they going to pray? And he was absolutely amazed at what the prayer was. And she says, you know, we feel sorry for you. And he thought, well, what have I done wrong now? You know, what, why do you feel sorry for me? And she goes, the, the, the reason I say that, no disrespect, is because our perception of the people in the West is you don't share. You don't share the little that you have. And we feel sorry for you because in our humble homes, we have nothing but we're very, very willing to share the nothing that we have with you. And therefore, we would like to pray that you get a spirit that enables you to share things with others. Can you imagine how he felt? Like, I'm going over there to help you. And there's this, this poor family praying with them, saying, I hope, not just you as an individual, but I hope the society and the culture from which you come is able to be more open and share what you have and let our lives be the example of having very little and being able to share the little that we have. So just to, to recap what, what I've said, that it is the case, I do believe, and I believe the message of the Bible is, is of God using us in all sorts of ways that we're probably not even aware of. And one day God will make known to us the impact that we've had. But God is in control of that. That God can use the smallest things in life, within our lives, to have a huge impact on people. I know, just as, just as, a, just as a, a very short story, when I first walked in, to my um, form group uh, at a school near here, I just thought, I want to walk out. I just, they're just all over the place. It's just, they're just, you know, and with the, what they kept saying was, how long is it before you leave us? Because they got, just got used to the supply teacher walking out because they're just not going to tolerate this. I said, don't worry, I'll, I'll stay with you till the end of the day. I thought, that's probably as long as I'll stay. No, I didn't. But, you know, so I, um, and then on the penultimate day, we were going in, into the form room, and I opened the door, and Rahim, who always comes in first, put his little head right, I'm here, sir, I'm here, sir, first one, okay, Rahim, come in. So he says, um, we're going to be in this form room next year. I says, well, I don't know where I'll be, Rahim, but uh, you're going to go up to G floor, because that's where you're moving to. And before I could move, I had this little boy with his hands out, hugging me and saying, oh, please don't leave, please. And it's, how do you put that into the right context? Is it about me? No. But I think what it is, is, is just that ability for us to try and be aware as to sometimes we're filling the gaps in people's lives and we're not even aware of it ourselves. And I do pray whoever you know, moves in and, and takes over the form, I hope they get some, some stability there. Isn't it wonderful that you know, that God can use the simplest things in life and can bring great blessings to other people. And at times we seem to get so bound up in what we can and cannot do. And yet if we just sit back, God will take over. But think about Joseph. How he must have thought at that point when at one point he must have thought that, you know, I've got everything here. I've got a father that adores me so much he doesn't send me out onto the fields. I can do no wrong. I've found favour with my father. 
probably found favour with his clan. And suddenly, at a moment's notice, he goes from the heights of being everything to having nothing, to being there, stuck in this well, not knowing whether he was going to live or die. And yet God rescues him. Not only does he rescue him, he has a tremendous plan for him. My hope and my prayer is, is that we too look into our lives and ask God, where do you want us to go? Where do you want me to be? And as difficult as it is to let God take over and see where that wonderful journey leads. Thank you.